There is an old Hindu proverb which states that there are a hundred paths of the mountain, all leading in the same direction. If this is true, then there can be few better examples of how these paths seem to intersect than when two of the most different and yet popular religions met, leading to the formation of a unique school of thought which to this day stands out from those around it for its blending of disparate sets of belief into one. This clash was between the world of Buddhism and Islam, and its product was what we today call Sufism, which stands even now as one of the most well-known syncretisms of two extremely different ideals into one system of thought. Here we will take a look at the histories of these two groups, at their origins, their popularization, their divisions, and finally their collision, a meeting which gave birth to the faith we now know as Sufism. The story of Sufism begins with the origins of Buddhism in the Indian city of Lumbini, circa 550. Here, a former nobleman named Siddhartha Gautama, disillusioned with the myriad of methods of breaking free of samsara reached by yogis across ancient India, came to the decision that he would stop searching outwards for a path towards enlightenment, and instead begin to look inwards. And so the young man, emaciated from years of misbegotten asceticism, sat in the shade of a tree and began to meditate. From these simple beginnings rose the philosophy and religion which today is called Buddhism, and which is practiced in one form or another by over 300 million people worldwide. The Buddha himself led no divine inspiration declaring his newfound road to nirvana, simply that all people are capable of attaining freedom from rebirth if they follow a simple path of moderation, which he referred to as the middle way. Thanks to this non-extreme philosophy, Buddhism quickly gained in popularity, becoming a major force in ancient India. But as with many other things, an increase in people meant an increasing number of often divergent opinions, and Buddhism quickly began to lose the unity of vision it once possessed. By the turn of the era, Buddhism had begun to show definite cracks in its doctrine. Around 200 BCE, the Mauryan Empire, led by Emperor Ashoka, worked to promulgate Buddhism throughout India and eventually exported it as far as Greece and Africa, along the way contributing to the building of monasteries and the publication of innumerable Buddhist texts. The spread of Buddhism was also aided by the development of the Silk Road between the Roman Empire and China, which arguably carried just as many new ideas and technologies as it did material goods. As the religions spread out across Asia and into parts of Europe, various groups began to put pieces of their own beliefs into the still young faith. Examples of these groups include the Madhyamaka school, founded by the philosopher Nagarjuna, and its later offshoot, the Yogacara school both of which attempted to further delineate the ideas of the Buddha through additional sutras. However, the largest division within Buddhism formed in the first century BCE, when a group known as the Mahayana Buddhists began to split from Buddhism at large. By the second century CE, the rift between this newer school and the traditional Theravada doctrine 
had become so pronounced that at the fourth great council of Buddhism, the two officially split, creating a division which stands to this day. This new tradition, Mahayana Buddhism, can most easily be described as a liberalization, often marked by an incorporation of local traditions and beliefs into an overall Buddhist worldview. For instance, many local deities were now turned into Bodhisattva, a person who has attained enlightenment but refuses nirvana so that they may reincarnate to help others in their paths towards samsara. Also, this new sect brought forth the belief that all creatures, even animals, are capable of reaching nirvana. This led to an increased emphasis on the Brahma-vihara philosophies of universal kindness and compassion, exemplified in the book Bodhicharyavatara, or The Way of the Bodhisattva, an 8th century text by Shantideva. This work also demonstrates the increased emphasis on ritual within the Mahayana tradition. These factors, combined with an increasing focus on esoteric philosophies, cosmologies, and other elements not present in the Buddha's original speeches, helped place Mahayana Buddhism apart from the older and more stable schools, including what we now know as Theravada Buddhism. Meanwhile, the Mahayana acceptance of local variations and customs assured its popularity. Disease Buddhism's acceptance abroad, allowing it to spread from India all over the world. Buddhism first touched the Middle East during Ashoka's reign, spread via the Silk Road's interaction with Arabic merchants. Eventually, it made its way to Afghanistan, where during the 3rd century CE reign of Emperor Kanishka of the Kushan Empire, it became well entrenched alongside the various Iranian cults which pervaded the region at the time. Afghanistan eventually blossomed into a major center of extra-Indian Buddhism. Thanks to Alexander the Great's earlier introduction of Hellenistic culture to the region, Buddhism experienced an artistic boom as well leading to the development of the first artistic representations of the Buddha, which had before been banned. Buddhism would spread from Afghanistan throughout the region and into the heart of the Persian Empire, where the many local deities could be easily transformed into Bodhisattva. Buddhism retained its position as one of the primary religions of the area for centuries, until the rise of a new prophetic religion led to its eventual decline, the religion of Muhammad, Islam. Islam began, much like Buddhism, with a single man's personal revelation. In Islam, that man was Muhammad, a member of an influential family in Meccan trade. However, whereas the Buddha considered his realizations wholly internal, Muhammad claimed his were delivered by the angel Gabriel in a cave outside the city around the year 610 CE. Muhammad's preachings were later collected by his followers into the Quran, a book which remains today the sole revealed holy text of Islam and is considered the literal word of God in written form. An Abrahamic religion, Islam descended from Judaism and Christianity and contains elements of and in references to both, most importantly in its focus on strict monotheism. For this stance against the many local gods of the area, Muhammad was eventually thrown out of Mecca and traveled to Medina in 622, a journey called the Hijra, which forms the basis of the Muslim calendar and is still undertaken today 
as part of the mandatory Islamic pilgrimage. Two years later, in 624, Muhammad returned with hundreds of new converts, took over Mecca, and in one of the most influential events in world history, went into the sacred Kaaba shrine and smashed the idols of the Arabic pagan gods. This event marks the very beginning of the Islamic Empire, an empire which would later spread to become one of the most powerful in world history. However, as with Buddhism, this rapid expansion created tensions within the region. And once again, we see a faith begin to tear itself into pieces under the strain of internal politics. Islam began in 632 with Muhammad's death. His followers, desiring a new leader for their young religion and embryonic empire, formed into two camps. Those who believed that Muhammad's early follower, Abu Bakr, handpicked by Muhammad, should take over for his mentor, and those who believed that the leadership should be strictly lineage-based and remain with Muhammad's descendants. Eventually, Abu Bakr's camp, the Sunni, won out, and he was declared the first caliph of Islam. However, the opposing group, the Shia, rejected the leadership of Bakr, as well as the next two caliphs. Under this division, the Shia became the more liberal of the two, encouraging an increased flexibility in interpreting the Quran, which helped to justify their beliefs in the moral superiority of Muhammad and his kin. And so we once again see another religion torn into two groups, one liberalized, one conservative. The question then becomes, when these two faiths finally meet, which groups will it be to make the first contact? Despite its split into two camps, Islam continued to expand faster than ever. The Islamic Empire would eventually come to cover all of the Middle East, as well as much of Southeast Asia, and even make inroads into the Western Chinese Empire. As with Buddhism, the spread rapidly led to contact with a wide variety of alien cultures, each with their own religious and philosophical beliefs. However, whereas Buddhism could easily incorporate these foreign deities and beliefs, into a pantheon of bodhisattva and a wide variety of rituals and practices, Islam's observance of strict monotheism and focus on pre-described activities prevented it from showing this sort of elasticity. The result is that in many regions, all those who fell outside of the Abrahamic traditions were treated as social outcasts and pagans. However, Eventually, even these subjugated groups began to exert influence on their Islamic rulers, and the resulting blend of Islam with folk mysticism turned into what is today known as Sufism. This third, small subgroup of Islam claimed, much like the other two larger ones, to trace its beliefs back to the Prophet Muhammad. The main divide between Islam at large and this new minority group was not practical, but philosophical. Whereas most Muslims believe in a God who was more or less unreachable by humans, Sufi mystics believed in the concept of Gnosis, a personal connection and knowledge of the Divine. The rest of Islam reacted poorly to this idea, and even today Sufism exists largely in small communities. While Sufism's beginnings are vague at best, the tradition is believed to have been passed down from masters to pupils, beginning with Hassan al-Basri around the year 700. The group reached its height circa 1000, when its beliefs were finally concretized in writing. And by 1200, a golden age of Sufism had arrived, its mystical tenets spreading vein-like throughout the Muslim world. The entrance 
intertwining Islam and Buddhism began quite early in the former's history, probably around 660. And within a century, Islam had spread to the Middle East and Southeast Asia's most heavily Buddhist populated areas. One of the first pieces of textual evidence of interfaith contact comes from the writings of Mo Kong, a Korean Buddhist pilgrim who writes of his attempts to avoid hostile Muslim conquerors on his way through Afghanistan. Even the Kalachakra Tantra, a 9th century text which forms the basis of much of Tibetan Buddhism, mentions several times Matumati, a man from Baghdad who would supposedly tear the Buddhist world apart. Much of Buddhism's hostility towards Islam is no doubt thanks to the Islamic Empire's refusal to grant Buddhists rights on par with Kafirs, Jews and Christians. To a starkly monotheistic religion like Islam, Buddhism's vast number of pseudo-deities would appear to be a prime example of mass idolatry. And even today, the Persian word for idol, but, betrays the early conflicts between Buddhists and Muslims. Eventually, however, Islam spread to areas such as Afghanistan, where Buddhism was far too entrenched to ignore or suppress. And finally, an uneasy peace developed between the two communities. After a while, Muslims began studying Buddhism from a more neutral perspective. And during the 12th century, the scholar al sharistini wrote what would be the first thorough Arabic treatise on Buddhism, a work which makes the not so surprising observation that Buddhist teachings can be very near to the teachings of the Sufis. This statement would not only prove to be true at the time it was written, but also prophetic for the future development of esoteric Islam. Already similar in basic tenets, Sufism and Buddhism's close coexistence from the 7th century onward would result in a subtle flow of Buddhist concepts into the younger tradition. By the year 1000, Sufism had begun to integrate Buddhist concepts into its theology, cosmology, and even practical traditions. The first hints of this mixing of philosophies came in 1068, when Yusuf Qas Hajib's long-form poem, Katabu Dilig, The Wisdom of Royal Glory, presented a representation of a Sufi mystic named Oturmesis as a cave-dwelling hermit who, with his begging bowl staff and simple white robe, is practically identical to the image of the Mahayana Buddhist monks prevalent in the region. Another physical example is the Sufi use of tespi, or prayer beads, used as an aid in the recitation of the 99 Quran Suras, or alternatively the names of God. These strings of 99 beads with one larger imam bead are practically identical to the Japa Mala carried by Mahayana monks for sutra recitation. Sufi meditation, called Murakaba, also began to take on both Buddhist appearances as well as goals. Anyone familiar with basic Buddhist philosophy would recognize terms such as absolute unity and self-annihilation, and yet these two ideas also became transposed into Sufism as Itlach and Fana. Itlach, the idea of a complete union with the divine, was far from the standard view of the rest of Islam, and yet shows definitely